Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their music, their history, their years together, their solo years, what's going on in the news, whatever comes to mind, we cover it all here in this show. I'm Ken Michaels, known for my other two Beatles programs, one of which is a syndicated Beatles radio show called Every Little Thing. Also, I'm involved with uh, another talk show podcast called Talk More Talk. It's all on the solo Beatles, and uh, that's a bi-weekly show that uh, airs on Facebook every other Monday night with uh, three other co-hosts, and uh, I'm being joined by My two other regulars in the program, first of all, a man who's been part of New York Radio now for the past 37 years at New York's WFUV. He is their resident Beatle expert there. He's done a lot of fantastic work on the station all these many years. And um, he is our own Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Well, thank you, Ken, and uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for pointing out the fantastic work. There was some crappy work in there, too, but we won't bring that up. Uh, (laughs) But uh, anyway, yeah, hi, everyone. Welcome to another show. And also, we have someone who many years worked for the New York Times, being a writer and reviewer in their classical department. He's also the author of a few Beatle books, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and the ebook, which unfortunately is uh, currently out of print, got that something, how the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand changed everything, currently a freelance writer, and that is Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken and Darren, and hello, everyone. On today's show, we're going to be doing a topic that was actually a suggestion to us from one of our listeners, and that is how we... As uh, Beatle fans that we are, after all these many years, how do we listen to the Beatles' music? Their group recordings, their solo music, how often do we listen? Uh, What do we listen to the most? What format do we listen to it on? It might be interesting to find out between the three of us what our listening habits are and how they may vary from each other. It'll be a lot more in detail than this. We'll cover a lot of topics on that subject. But before we do that, as usual, we have the latest Beatle news to get to. And we're going to start with a news item that I was actually just handed to (laughs) from one of our listeners, Tom Brennan. Thank you, Tom. And it looks like there's going to be a special that will air on PBS this month, February, actually February 29th. And it's all on Chuck Berry. And it will include rare and classic footage of the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Bruce Springsteen, Jimi Hendrix, and others covering Chuck Berry's music. And it's going to be called Brown-Eyed Handsome Man. And it says, and this is according to Rolling Stone, that the film collects several decades' worth of performances, including two very early ones from the Beatles and the Stones from 1964, uh, it will include the Beatles' performance of Roll Over Beethoven from their Washington Coliseum concert mm-hmm. and uh, the Rolling Stones playing Around and Around at a UK gig. Mm. Okay. It also says the most recent performance occurred a few years ago when Jeff Lynne and ELO delivered a rendition of Roll Over Beethoven, complete with an intro of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which mm. which Alan never never approved of. Alan <laughs> never approved of this, so... Doesn't really count. No, I think it's kind of cool. (laughs) (laughs) What did you think of that recording? I loved it. Classical guy that you. I I I loved it when it came out. I thought it was great. Uh huh. You know, it's it's certainly a different take on Roll Over Beethoven. There. Oh, definitely. You know what? But both Roll Over Beethoven and the Beethoven Fifth Symphony are so well known to everybody that Mm -hmm. a different take is a good thing. You know, sometimes, and I thought they did it really well. How about a fifth of Beethoven? No, that I hated. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, figured you would. <laughs> actually, uh, in a nutshell, what do you think of what Emerson, Lick and Palmer would do back in the day when you heard their stuff for the first time? 
Hmm. You know, it's interesting. I, I liked pictures at an exhibition. I liked their various classical things that they did. And I know that one of the composers whose music they did, um, the South American composer Alberto Ginastera, also loved what they did with his Toccata. But I was Aaron Copeland, who wrote Hoedown, which they did, once came to Syracuse University where I was a student um, for a talk and I went to see him. And someone actually asked, what do you think of, uh, you know, what Emerson, Lake and Palmer have done with Hoedown? And he thought for a minute and he said, you know, it's a terrible thing to hear your music ruined. (laughs) So different, different strokes, as they say. Yeah. All right. Mm. I thought it was brilliant. Mm. Anyway, um, also in this special... We will have Paul McCartney's performance of Brown Eyed Handsome Man at the Cavern Club in 1999. And you were there. I was there. Yep. Yes. And a few other things. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers doing Carol. Linda Ronstadt with Back in the USA. Uh, Let's see. Bruce Springsteen doing Johnny B. Good. Keith Richards with Carol. Mm -hmm. It's all in this special coming up February 29th on PBS. Brown Eyed Handsome Man. Sounds good. Again. Thank you, Tom Brennan, for that. We have a few news items on two of the Beatles' sons. The first one is a serious subject regarding the health of Julian Lennon. He posted online that a few days ago he went to visit his dermatologist in Los Angeles, where she noticed a little bump on his head that actually was a mole that had been there, along with the birthmark for the last 57 years. She urged him to have a biopsy only to learn 24 hours later that it was malignant. And she urged him to have it removed immediately. He says, hopefully we managed to remove all that was cancerous, but the mole is being sent off for further, deeper analysis, and he will have the results of that test next week. This health scare has prompted Julian to urge everyone to have uh, health checkups as often as possible. So let's uh, keep our fingers crossed for, for Julian. Let's hope and pray that he's okay. Very scary stuff there. Yep, absolutely. News from two weeks ago about George Harrison's son, Danny, and the Harrison estate bringing back the Dark Horse label by partnering in a new multifaceted global deal with BMG. This agreement will include releases from the acclaimed catalog of George Harrison's legendary label, Dark Horse Records, and his Indian label imprint, Harrisongs, as well as Joe Strummer's solo catalog, including his works alongside the Mescaleros. Dark Horse Records will also release new recordings through BMG, including the current Tom Petty Estate charity single, For Real for Tom, featuring Danny Harrison, Jacob Dylan, Amos Lee, Willie Nelson, and his two sons, Lucas and Micah. Now, the first releases were released on January the 24th on all digital platforms, including the George Harrison produced Ravi Shankar, Chance of India, Ravi Shankar and Ali Akbar Khan in concert 1972. Joe Strummer, we know of from being in The Clash, Joe Strummer and the Mescaleras' albums Rock Art and the X-Ray Style, Global Agogo and Street Core. And the band Attitudes with their album Ain't Love Enough, The Best of the Attitudes. Upcoming releases in 2020 include compilations, live albums and box sets featuring rare and unreleased recordings from the Dark Horse label, many of which will be made available digitally for the first time ever. Now, when I'm reading about this, I have two questions. Obviously, does this include George Harrison's solo catalog in any way? And also, are we to assume that everything that's being released here is strictly digital? We're trying to find out all that information as we speak. It's my opinion that I'm not 100% uh, sure of this, that everything is digital, I believe, although I'm not certain that Universal handles all of George's solo music, but I can't be certain of that. It's very, confu- it's very confusing. Ken and I had a conversation yesterday uh, on our own and trying to like pick apart Dark Horse uh, as part of Capital, as part of Universal, and now BMG's in the picture. Wasn't it originally A&M? Or maybe not originally, originally. Dark Horse started out as an A&M label, 
or A and M did the distribution, or it was a Dark Horse was a subsidiary, whatever the the proper wording is, and then it was switched to Warner Brothers after a couple of years because of uh, Harrison's. I believe it was he missed the deadline to put the 33 and a third album out on his 33 and a third birthday. Uh, he had, he was sick. Harrison was sick. I forget uh, I forget what he had, but he was pretty sick. He was coming off the lawsuit uh, with Bright Tunes. Mm. The album 33 and a third was ended up being delayed. A&M sued him and that ended up uh, George took Dark Horse over to Warner Brothers. At some point, either just before or just after, I believe it was, uh, George's passing, uh, Dark Horse flipped over to Capital, and Capital, of course, now is part of Universal. There's no more EMI, but yet Dark Horse, the new deal is with BMG. So it's very confusing, and we are in the process of trying to sort all of that out. I'm interested in finding out how the Joe Strummer and the Mescaleros catalog plays into this. WFUV uh, has played a lot of the stuff that Joe Strummer did with the Mescaleros, and shortly before his untimely death, he came up to WFUV. So seeing his solo stuff with the Mescaleros mentioned in this deal was pretty interesting. And if I'm not mistaken, the uh, the uh, Ravi Shankar Ali Akbar Khan uh, live recording probably is the Apple album, the Has live double album that Apple put out, I think. Mm-hmm. So uh, lots of things, lots of layers to this Dark Horse BMG onion that uh, uh, I'm curious to kind of sort through. And we'll make every effort to try to get a definitive word on this for the next show. Also, uh, Danny had said in a quote that um, they'll also be looking to expand the Dark Horse family with new artists. So it won't just be reissuing old albums. Okay. All right. Speaking of Danny Harrison. Last year, a highlight for many of us was seeing Danny open for Jeff Lynne's ELO while touring the U.S. It's just been announced that Danny will be joining Jeff again on the road for Jeff's From Out of Nowhere tour, which so far will be a UK-Euro-Ireland tour with 15 dates beginning September 19th through October 21st. Will that mean a return to the U.S. this year for Jeff and for Danny? We'll have to wait and find out. All right. Um, While the world is in complete shock and extremely saddened by the death of NBA legend Kobe Bryant, as well as his daughter Gianna, who, along with seven other people, died in a helicopter crash last weekend, Paul McCartney released this statement on the tragedy. So sad to hear about Kobe Bryant, his daughter and their friends. He was a great player and a very impressive human being, sending many blessings and much love to all his family at this most difficult time. Love, Paul. Mm -hmm. Some very nice words there from Paul McCartney on that. Though there's not much to say about it. uh, If you watch the Super Bowl, you'll know that Paul and Nancy were there. You did see Paul looking very excited while the game was going on in the booth that he was staying at. Don't know which side he was rooting for. But um, but he probably knows what state Kansas City is in. <laughs> <laughs> Just say it by that, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people don't. <laughs> yeah, <Isn't> that's something. <laughs> uh, but he should have, uh, you know, he had songs ready for either team, hmm. regardless of which one won. He could have performed a song for each one. Kansas yes. City. Yeah. San Francisco Bay Blues. Oh, right, right. That's true. He could have just been taken out, do one song at the end of the game, that's it. Mm -hmm. But no, nothing. But anyway, you know, Paul (laughs) goes to a lot of these games, a lot of uh, sports events in the U.S. Did anyone notice that Paul appeared to be uh, sucking on a lemon in every picture that he took? (laughs) I only saw one photo like that. I saw a bunch of them, and they all had the kind of like, you know, like he was eating lemons. While he was there, but yeah, he's up in the nice box, and uh, yeah, I'm curious if he had any allegiance to either of the teams. Mm. I don't know. All I know is he, uh, unfortunately, Darren, he has been seen at Yankee games. You know. Yeah, I know. I yeah. know. But, but, uh, why do you I, say unfortunately? I think it shows great <laughs> taste. <laughs> uh, he's uh, he's been at Met games too, but more than more times than not, he's been spotted. At Yankee Stadium. 
Mm-hmm. I know, you know. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, he's not, no one's perfect. I know. <laughs> this is true. And there was a flaming pie night at Shea Stadium. This is true. And I was there. There's no Egypt Station night at Yankee Stadium. No. <laughs> no. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Between the Mets and the Yankees, he represented the Mets first. And like I pointed out, I don't know if I've done it on the show or not. Aren't the CDs blue and orange uh, in Good Evening New York City? I think so. Right. Although I think there's a picture in the liner notes of a guy wearing a Yankee hat, but in the album art, album packaging for Good Evening New York City. But the discs are blue and orange. And I have thought about that, that if that was done intentional. Mm. Probably because Probably. it was recorded in, in there. Yeah, wasn't it? It, but still, it's, it's like, I don't know, even though it was at a baseball stadium that the Mets play in the concerts. Uh, I don't know if that would translate into album art, but maybe. Mm. I think Paul was aware of it. Let's My see mind. if he puts out, uh, you know, one of the Yankee Stadium shows from what was it, 2011, and the discs are pinstripes. One disc mm. is pinstripes, the other disc is gray. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I have to say. Mm. <laughs> okay. All right, let's get on with a bit more news. Variety is reporting that a screening of a few minutes of the upcoming documentary on the Beatles' Get Back, Let It Be sessions, directed by Peter Jackson, took place at Universal Music's annual showcase that coincided with the Grammy Awards. Jeff Jones of Apple Records said because of the perception that the 1970 movie was a depressing look at the Beatles coming apart, Jackson was brought in to digitally clean up old footage, removing what reporter Jam Aswad described as the murky, shadowy atmosphere of the original. Jones said, we have created a brand new film that will attempt to bust the myth that the Let It Be sessions were the final nail in the Beatles' coffin. And according to Aswad, Jackson succeeded based on what was shown. He's quoted as saying, an amazing counter-narrative to the Let It Be film has ensued. It's brighter both visually and spiritually, with many, many shots of the Beatles joking around, making fun of each other, singing in silly accents, and generally indulging in vintage mop-top hijinks. Mm. It also features... I wouldn't say mop-top, really. I'm quoting him. Yeah, I know. I wouldn't say hijinks. (laughs) (laughs) He says it also features many scenes of the group rehearsing songs from the Abbey Road album, their true swan song, which would be recorded over the following summer, and even rough versions of songs that would appear on solo records. On the basis of this clip, Beatle fans will lose their minds over Uh, this film. (laughs) We just have a bunch of zombie-like Beatle fans walking around later this year. (laughs) We will, no matter what. Uh, how can you not look forward to this? Yeah, Anything really. that you haven't seen before, just be happy that it's coming out. Mm-hmm. A new documentary, John Lennon, The Final Year, will be coming out this uh, this year at a time with the 40th anniversary of his death. It will include never-before-seen interviews with people who spent time with John during the last years of his life. The film's producer is the ever-busy Ken Womack author of several Beatle books, including two separate ones on the life of George Martin, the most recent book on the Abbey Road album called Solid State. And uh, Ken will also have a book to coincide with this film called John Lennon 1980, The Final Days in the Life of Beatle John, due out on John's birthday. Okay. The 9th. A lot going on there with Ken Womack. He's very busy. and We should find out if he ever goes out of the house. I don't think he does. Yeah. I wow. don't know. I don't know. He's got a book coming out every month, so it seems. <laughs> the Ken Womack Book of the Month Club. There you go. <laughs> Ken writes a new book each month for you. Yeah. Well, it, it seems like he, he's that prolific that he can do that. He will like, be on a panel with me and the Talk More Talk uh, crew. Could have a celebrity yeah. celebrity death match between Ken Womack and Bruce Spicer. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Who will end up putting out the most Beatle books? <laughs> Finally, a reminder that February 11th, we will see the 50th anniversary re- release on Blu-ray and HD digital of Harry Nilsson's animated TV special, The Point, with lots of bonus material. And on all the home video releases, it is Ringo that does the narration 
for the film. Great. When it first aired on television, Dustin Hoffman did the narration, but all the future home video releases had Ringo. So that's coming out February the 11th. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Yeah. That's it for, for Beatle News. Our main topic this time out is how we listen to the Beatles. And let me just give credit where credit is due. This idea comes from Albert Rojas, who wrote to us a few months ago saying, Hello, I am curious to know how each of you listen to the Beatles. Streaming, vinyl, CD, iTunes purchase, and rips on MP3. I know Darren still has a track. <laughs> you added that. <laughs> no, he did write this. He did I'm really? not kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I actually was watching, uh, <laughs> uh, speaking about needing to get out more often, I was watching and I was getting very, in, 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 on, on YouTube, getting very uh, into this whole thing on, uh, on the 8-track tape and how they were made and how they worked and, and good players and bad players to get to listen to your 8-tracks. And I don't know why I was spending so much time with the 8-track one night recently, but maybe I shouldn't reveal that to everyone. <laughs> So it speaks volumes about me. No, I don't have an A-Track player, and I don't listen to the Beatles on A-Track. Although I think I have a one of the White Album A-Tracks that I found in the garbage. Oh, okay. I don't have any Beatles on A-Track. I'm sorry. Okay. Me either. <laughs> so this is going to cover a range of topics here, and it involves their group recordings, their solo recordings, how much time we actually spend listening to the Beatles music, does our work in any way relate to it? Do we spend more time listening to the Beatles because uh, in some ways it's a job for us? You know, there's a number of questions we can all ask each other on, uh, uh, on this particular topic. It's very wide ranging here. So um, my first question is to the two of you, how often do we listen to Beatles or solo in our spare time? And, um, Let's start with you, Alan. Hmm. Um, well, I don't really have any spare time. You know, it's kind <laughs> of, it's, you know, we've talked about this before, uh, and, and, and it really is a problem for someone whose job is listening to music all day and often all night. You know, if I go out to cover concerts, I mean, finding spare time to listen to something that isn't what you're working on is really difficult. But um, so I can't really answer the question of how often, but I, I would say, you know, I would say in a given week, there are several times when, you know, just between things, I might put on a, a Beatles track or a solo track or, or something like that. Or um, if, if driving places counts as spare time. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, I, lately, I've been listening a lot to Sirius XM's Beatles channel. And what I like about it is that, first of all, since I'm not picking the songs, I don't know what's coming next. But I know it's going to be something of the Beatles, you know, as opposed to just turning on the radio and you don't know it could be anything. And it often, it, it may be a cover of a Beatles song. It may be a solo track. It may be, they, they have unusual things now and then they have interview snippets. You can get, uh, you know, depending what time you drive out to do your errands or whatever, you can listen to Peter Asher's show, which I always find kind of interesting. And so uh, if that counts as spare time, that's kind of how it's how, how I do it. I used to listen in the car to cassettes a lot, and then for a while to CD, and then for a while I could get my Walkman to connect with my car stereo. So not Walkman, um, uh, iPod, iPod. Remember those? They came and went. Um, <laughs> you know, like, and I guess my phone could do it now, but I never really do that. Uh, so. Yeah, it's, it's 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 I guess uh, mostly serious. If I'm at home and I have a few minutes, I have Media Monkey, which is a lot like iTunes, but um, I think a bit more flexible. Plus, with the amount of music I have on it, which in my case must be something like five hundred thousand tracks by now. Last time I looked, it was like four hundred thousand tracks. Um, wow. Media Monkey can handle that 
better than iTunes can. At least that was the case when I gave up iTunes and went to Media Monkey. So I have, you know, really carefully sorted chronological playlists um, for each of the Beatles and the Beatles. And there are, there's a playlist for the 1987 CDs. There's a playlist for the 2009 CDs. There is a playlist for AB Road, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, often I'll just sort of pick one of those and listen to as much as I can before I have to get on to the next thing. Mm. But is it usually just, as you said before, cherry picking songs or do you listen to complete albums if you can? Well, what I'll do uh, if I'm doing it on Media Monkey is I'll cherry pick a song and put it on and then play whatever comes after it, you know, until Mm. I have to get back to work or, you know, do something else. Um, Sometimes I cherry pick. Sometimes I'll I'll sit there and, you know, go through a bunch of different ones, you know, uh, you know, all through the span of their career if I want to, you know, hear something. But um, usually it's just putting putting something on and and invariably that will start with strawberry fields. Maybe not invariably, but a lot of the time, Um, Mm. you know, or if, you know, like if we're going to talk about, I guess that. I don't know if that counts as spare time either, but if we're going to talk about an album, obviously I'm going to listen to that uh, a few times before the show. So, uh, but that I can justify as kind of work in a way, you know, because mm-hmm. it has to be done. True. <laughs> I mean, you would be doing it anyway. You just, it's more pressing if you have a show to do. That's all. Yeah. 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 Darren, how about you? My listening is very, very similar to what Alan just said. But, of course, I have the music that WFUV plays that is also front and center uh, on a daily basis. I write the weekly new album reviews for the radio station's website, WFUV's website, WFUV.org. So, you know, each week I've got my focus on uh, a new album. But I also, also find that I need to get away from from what FUV plays. And needless to say, when I go away from uh, the FUV sound, I don't know if I'd say half the time it's Beatles related, but it could very well be that, that often that I listen to the Beatles as opposed to other things, jazz or other rock bands or whatever. And I tend to, I used to, I mean, you know, I, I, made it clear that I'm not a big digital guy and I'm old school in many ways that if you know I got a CD I'm going to play the CD I'm not all that uh, into the downloading and whatnot I did recently start using Spotify to listen to music that I own and in some instance sample things uh, mainly for work, the WFUV that I don't own, but can sample it. But if there's something that really appealed to me, I will still go out and track down the CD or vinyl, whether new or used. But when it comes to the Beatles, they do play a very important part. Like I said, if you split my listening up from separate the WFUV related listening and the um, leisure listening, I would say it's probably not inaccurate to say half of the time when the leisure side of me is in charge, it's Beatle related. I too listen to the Sirius XM's Beatle channel. I kind of like listen to it though with uh, a radio programmer's ear. So there are things sometimes that frustrate me about the way the rotation uh, is done with the Beatle songs that they play. But I do enjoy Chris Carter because he'll dig super deep. And Peter Asher's show is very entertaining. But In the car lately, it's been listening to things on Spotify, but I want it known that I have the physical, many copies of each physical album, uh, many physical copies of each album, rather, at home. Uh, I used to be one to bring the CDs with me. I had a set of all the 87, 88 remasters that I had burned on CDs that I could bring. They were my road copies. Those kind of don't get used all that much anymore. And, of course, the iPod had all the Beatles albums in there and most of the solo stuff that doesn't get used anymore. In fact, I'm not even sure where it is. And it's usually albums. I'm usually listening to albums. I'm not into other people's playlists. And 
don't really make my own. I just go with the albums. If I'm in a Beatle head, I'll say to myself, all right, I'm going to listen to the Beatles early, late. How about late? All right. Uh, you, you know, put on the white album and it'll be the whole album. Start at track one and get as far as I can, you know, as far as I get into when, whenever I get to where I'm going or finish what I'm doing at home. Mm. So. You know, that that brings me to another question, and I'm going to answer this question for myself in just a moment. But when it comes to the group, do you spend more time listening to their earlier music, their later music, the middle period? Does it matter at all to you? Yeah, it's mostly later period. That's always been my favorite from Sergeant. Well, from uh, you know, Rubber Soul Revolver on. I've always been a little more partial to the later stuff than the early stuff. Uh, it's been a while, for example, since I've listened to Please Please Me or uh, Beatles for Sale, which, you know, every every you gotta, every you got band has a best album and worst album. And when it comes to the Beatles, uh, I mean, there's an album that would sink to the bottom if we took a poll. For me, Please Please Me and Beatles for Sale are probably my least favorite Beatle albums. So the inclination is to not listen to them as much as, say, Abbey Road or the Magical Mystery Tour or something. Okay. Hmm. Alan, I want to ask you specifically about that. Do you have a preference when you do listen? Do you tend to spend more time in one period than the others or what? Um, I probably would listen to the later music uh, first uh, or more frequently. But on the other hand, you know, you, you put on – Please, please me in. I saw her standing there kicks in and there's, you know, how can you, <laughs> how can you walk away from that? It's, um, mm. you know, and even, you know, we've, we've talked about Beatles for sale and, you know, it being, you know, possibly my least favorite album, but that, you know, least favorite among Beatles albums is like still better than most other people. So, mm. I mean, I, if, if I walked into a room and, uh, or, you know, if I had left a playlist playing and it was up to Rubber Soul, it wouldn't be like I turned it off. I'd turn it off. Um, yeah, same with me. But, mm. you know, while Darren was talking, I was thinking as well that, you know, I also, for for the really late stuff that's had the anniversary editions, I mean, I'll, I'll frequently put on the 5.1 Blu-ray version um, just because... I like that a lot. And I mean, if I have the time to listen to a whole album and it's going to be pepper through Abbey Road, I'll, I'll probably put on the, uh, the 5.1. But that aside, you know, I mean, if, if to, to sort of get to Mr. Rojas's question where he was talking about formats, you know, if I really have the time and I've been able to make the time now and then, particularly when, new releases of this of the LP formats come out like when all the monos came out or when all the stereos came out on on LP you know after the last batch of remasterings you know I sat there and listened to the entire set I have a really good turntable and and stereo system and listening to them end to end you know just all the albums from start to finish that really was that's probably the best time I've had listening to Beatle records lately. Not that I ever have a bad time, but like that was special, you know, Uh just just the, even just the whole business of getting up and turning it over, you know, that was how it was, you know, that was how I grew up listening to them. And there was a, I never would have imagined that that would have like a little nostalgic thrill, but it does, you know, it just does. Um, plus in, in a lot of ways, uh, to me, it really does sound the best. So just wanted to add that since I was mostly talking about really sort of digitized music when, when I said my part. Yeah. Right. And, and, and what I didn't, uh, what I, I don't know if I made clear or not, uh, just kind of jumping off what Alan just said. In my case, it's probably more CDs than vinyl. I will admit, you know, the lazy uh, part of me, the CD is always a little easy. You don't have to get up in the middle and convenient. You could put it on and walk away for a longer span of time. Probably mm-hmm. CDs more than vinyl, but in my heart, they're equal. And uh, one thing that I'm sure that you're going to go down this road, Ken, when you uh, tell us your, your habits, mm. I probably listen 
if you break everything down and it's like, all right, FUV listening here and leisure listening on all the other acts and then split that pie into, all right, other bands and Beatles, split the Beatle pie. I would say probably more solo stuff than the band. Okay. I listen to, and I, it could, I, it could actually be fairly unbalanced. Maybe, you know, like maybe three quarters of Beatle related music I listen to is solo. And that's simply because there's more of the solo stuff and less less tendency to listen to the same handful of albums. Again, because I do albums rather than just songs, but probably more so solo. And I and I have a feeling that's kind of a thing you're going to uh, emphasize, Ken. I'll bring that up. But as long as you mention the solo, Alan, comparing the group to the solo and how much time you spend listening to both. Hmm. Um, well, these days I'm listening to an awful lot of Paul McCartney, <laughs> <laughs> seeing as I'm, you know, working on a book. But normally speaking, I would probably spend more time with group stuff than solo stuff. I mean, it, it really, you know, all these things, it depends what kind of mood you're in, you know. Sometimes it just mm -hmm. strikes me that, you know, I want to hear Flowers in the Dirt or I want to hear Cloud Nine or, you know, and they're all at my fingertips all the time. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do it if, um, you know, something occurs to me. I mean, even, uh, I don't know, the other day I was listening to Sentimental Journey and, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it just some, sometimes something will occur to me and I'll want to hear it and I'll, I'll put it on if I can find the time. And, uh, you know, so like that. Well, within the Beatles catalog, there's so much variety. You can be in the mood for any album. Absolutely. You, you might want to hear Wildlife one minute and hear you know, tug of war the next and they're two completely different albums. Yeah. You know, in terms of production and everything. You know, it's a funny thing. I mean, you know, in, in, in the sense of, you know, mankind as such is capable of being discontent with no matter what the circumstances are. You know, when I was a kid and had a hundred albums, I would have wanted, I would have done anything for the life I have now where, you know, most, not most walls in my house, but quite a few walls in my house are filled with LPs and CDs. And there's, there's, you know, there's thousands and thousands of them, not to mention what's on Media Monkey. And the problem with that is you want to hear a record and you can stand in front of your record shelf trying to figure out what you want to hear until the amount of time you have to hear it is gone and you end up not hearing anything. <laughs> Whereas when I was a kid with a hundred records, it was like, you know, okay, I got Led Zeppelin one. I got, you know, these were all new records at the time and stuff. And I'd come home from school and I might put on Abbey Road. I might put on Led Zeppelin one. I might put on um, the Court of the Crimson King or whatever. And it might be, you know, the same thing over, over the next few weeks because I only had a hundred, but, I yeah. always knew what to take off the shelf and play then. And now it's like, a, it's like being in a maze almost, you know? Yeah. You, you know, a, you don't know what artist to go to. And then uh, when you find one, it's like, all right, he's got 25 albums. Which one of these 25? Right. Uh, I pick from, I, I do the same thing. And I, and I completely agree with you about listening when I was in my teens, even into my twenties and the amount of music that I have in my home fueled by the fact that i worked in radio and get you know constantly almost would well it's changed it's not like this today but back in the day getting stuff on almost a daily basis yeah uh the bad thing was that you don't really get the chance to sit down and sink your teeth into any one album for any extended period of time because you get listen to one and it's like an assembly line next right uh, yeah next mm. now i know the next. listeners are going to feel really sorry for the both of us but <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> Well, I can certainly relate to what you were both saying about that when you have a huge record collection and it takes you forever to decide what you want to listen to. But when it comes to the Beatles, the group and the solo, despite the fact that there's over 100 albums there to pick from, I always kind of know what I'm in the mood to listen to. Mm -hmm. So with me, I find it kind of interesting what, what you were saying in particular, Alan, uh, about uh, the Beatles channel on Sirius XM that you don't know what song you're about to hear. My greatest memories growing up are listening to the radio and not knowing what songs they're going to play. 
I mean, you know the format of the radio station, but right. you don't know what to expect. And so most of the time when I listen to the Beatles, I listen to it the same way as I do my radio show, Every Little Thing. Everything is a mix with me. I mix the group and the solo together. It's just like a radio program. And I also throw in songs they wrote for other people, cover versions of their songs, just like a radio program. And when I do that, I've, I've compiled a lot of different CDs this way. I go in the car. I listen to it that way. I don't remember how I programmed it. And I like the unpredictability of all that, uh -huh. as opposed to knowing an album so well, you know every song that's going to follow the way that, the way that it's laid out. Uh -huh. And obviously there was a lot of work put into sequencing of songs on albums, and I admire all the work and the beauty of that. It is an artistic statement, an album. I love to listen to albums, but I don't listen to albums as much as I listen to mixes because I like hearing a combination of music through the decades. I like to bounce around a lot. I like going from the 60s to the 90s to the 70s to today to the 80s, back to the 60s. I like it that way. And when you hear the Beatles music that way, the group and the solo mixed together, you realize the consistency of it all and how it all works together very well. Uh -huh. So that's how I listen to the Beatles most of the time. And every week when I do the live broadcast of Every Little Thing, as I'm playing the music over the air, I am listening to it too. So in my spare time, you know, I listen back to mixes that I've done, but there are times when I will listen to a complete album. And most of the time, kind of like Darren, I listen to the solo albums. Uh -huh. Because even though I'm very familiar, extremely familiar with the solo music, it's nowhere near as, as familiar as I am with the group because I've had that in my head since 1964, all those albums. You know, I've had more time to listen to the Beatles as a group. And the solo music, there's just so much of it that I never get tired of it. There's always an album that I'm in the mood to listen to that I haven't heard for a while. So most of my listening tends to be in the car, especially if I'm on any kind of a trip that'll be half an hour or, or longer. So I can just take an album, in this case a CD. Most of my listening is on CD, although I will always say I love vinyl. I still have more vinyl than I have CD. But for me to listen to albums, to listen to vinyl, it means we have one turntable in the house. It's in my living room. It's in the same room as our TV. The TV gets used up a lot. I may not have the living room to my access. And it means more, uh, you know, intense listening. It means you're going to sit down and really listen. It can't be background. Uh -huh. You know, it's right. more of an effort when you, when you put the vinyl on as opposed to CDs. I also listen quite a lot while I'm doing a lot of my work in, in my den where I do all my Beatles shows. I always go to YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, and I cherry pick certain songs, Beatles and solo, whatever I'm in the mood to listen to, as well as a lot of other music. And it's a lot easier for me not to get up out of my chair and go find a CD or a vinyl album. It's just go right to the song. Almost everything's on YouTube and I don't have to do much else. Uh -huh. And I'm always in the mood for some song, whether it's Beatles or solo. So all I got to do is just go right there, find the song and play it. So it's kind of similar, my listening habits in some ways, to what the two of you are saying, because I like not knowing what to expect when I'm listening to the music. I do like to listen to albums all the way through. But like I said, it has to be when I know I've got half an hour or longer to really listen, which tends to be in the car. And um, I listen to the solo album so much more than I listen to the group. When I do listen to the group, it tends to be when the new releases come out, when the box sets came out for Sgt. Pepper, the White Album, Abbey Road. The first thing I go to are the outtakes before the remixes. I spend a lot more time listening to, to the outtakes. And for, say, about a month after these box sets come out, I'm really just burying myself and listening to the outtakes. And then I put that away. Then I go back to my regular listening habits. Uh -huh. um, and once in a while, I will take out a Beatles album, a, a CD, and play it in the car. has to be for long trips. Whenever I'm on vacation somewhere and I'm going to be in the car, I always take a Beatles CD, but I always take lots of solo CDs because there's so much more of that. So, um, 
you know, that's that's part of the enjoyment for me is knowing that there's so much music out there to explore that I can never get tired of the Beatles. You know, there's always an album that I haven't heard for quite a while that I'm in the mood to listen to. You know, I listened to uh, London Town the other day. It's probably the first time in a few years that I've listened to London Town. I will play a song from it every now and then on my radio show, but it had been a couple of years since I heard that. So I'm always in the mood to hear a specific album. It tends to be the solo stuff Uh much more than the group for me. At least that's how it is right now. Um, And when it comes to the group, it, it really is tough for me to say whether I listen to the later stuff or the middle stuff. I just go by my gut feeling in the moment. And these days, if I'm going to take out a Beatles CD, it'll probably be Revolver or it'll be the White Album. Uh-huh. But you never know. If I feel like listening to any other of their albums, then I play them. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for right now, the ones that, that I tend to go to are those, uh, maybe Abbey Road or Let It Be. They tend to be the later stuff. But if I'm in the mood for early Beatles, sometimes there's nothing like that. Right. Take out a hard day's night. There's nothing like the energy oh, yeah. in a hard day's night, you know, and all original songs. And most of it is up tempo rockers with a couple of ballads in there. And sometimes I feel like that's that's heaven listening to a hard day's night. So it depends on whatever mood I'm in. All right. <laughs> Do you ever put together your own compilations, guys? Since we just talked about compilations right. in mm-hmm. our last show, do you ever put together your own? whether it's your own CD or uh, Spotify list or whatever. I have done. I have, um, I don't tend to do it that much now, um, but I used to back in the cassette days. So we're talking about maybe the eighties, the seventies and eighties for me. I used to have a general Beatles compilation that had all of like 90 minutes of the stuff that I thought was absolutely the cream of the crop, starting with I saw her standing there and, you know, going all the way through chronologically. The other thing I used to do, um, I was just thinking about this back in the, in the cassette days is that I would put together these, they're not, not exactly compilations, but I would walk around with, the entire Beatles catalog on cassettes. And, uh, you know, what I did was I got, you know, the best quality cassettes I could get. I got the Mobile Fidelity Half Speed Master LPs. I recorded the LPs in order, putting all of the singles and B-sides and whatever in between the albums where they would go chronologically. And then, uh, you know, just walk around listening to these things and uh, also a couple of really long trips like um, driving from New York to South Carolina to Charleston uh, where I was Mm. covering a festival for a couple of years um, and found that that trip is exactly the amount of time that you need to listen to the entire Beatles catalog plus the Beethoven 7th and Purcell Stido and Aeneas. And, uh, but you know, what I found like listening to it that way, chronologically start to finish and, you know, I would just, just do it all the time in town too. I would just have a cassette in the, in the cassette player and be playing it, you know, unless sometimes it was the compilation, but mostly it was the albums that you end up, you, you end up getting to know this stuff so well, you know, when I wrote my first book about the Beatles, the uh, Fiden one, which is now called From the Cavern to the Rooftop. A lot of that, I, I wrote the book in like 19 days. And a lot of it was entirely based on stuff that occurred to me during those trips to Charleston and walking around town listening to stuff on, on Walkman, you know, just because I'd heard them so many times. And, you know, you're listening to a record, you make connections and you come up with ideas about what's, you know, what's going on, what's connected to what, what the meanings were, all that stuff. So uh, that made writing that book extremely easy. So, hmm. yeah. So you find it fascinating when you listen chronologically to the music? Uh, yeah, you know, but that takes, you know, close to 10 hours, I think. So, um, uh-huh. yeah, it's uh, that in a way, you know, if, if, 
time is like one of the ultimate luxuries for me. I mean, that's the way to do it. If I have the time to do it, it's, it's just, uh, you know what, it's an incredible story. Even yeah. apart from all the biographical details, like you get in the anthology or something like that, just listening to the music start to finish is an incredible story of, of developing creativity over a period of time. Right. You just see constant growth from the very beginning. Yeah. And, you know, if you make your compilation and you make it chronological, too, you get sort of the truncated version of that. But it also, you know, still works as, as a, a, a way of listening and still getting that whole narrative arc from I saw her standing there to you know, the end or something. Jared, how about you? I was never one for playlists or mixtapes or anything like that. So when I was younger and I had a really high-end cassette player, I would attempt to make mixtapes before I knew that they were going to be called mixtapes. <laughs> but I would become such a perfectionist with what I was doing that it would become more of a an exercise in frustration and misery for me because it would be like I got a 90-minute tape here. And, and this would be for any artist that I was deciding I was going to put on cassette. What could I get to add up all the time? So this album is over 45 minutes long. It's not going to fit on one side. So this is not a candidate to be put on tape. Then I would go to, if I attempted to make a mixtape or something like that, it would be like, uh, you know, hit pause, get the record, cue it up. Well, I didn't cue it far enough back. Got to do it again, hit record. <laughs> and then the levels, uh, you know, my cassette deck used to be so high, so uh, so sensitive that if the, you know, the recordings, you go from album to album to album, the levels would be all out of whack. And uh, yeah, so I, I kind of swore off that and never got into the whole mixtape thing uh, when it like and then, uh, you know, I never got really into the mixtape thing all that much. And when uh, I mean, putting an iPod on shuffle is the extent of what I would do. And right. even there it wasn't all that often. It was usually listened to. If I want to mix, I'll go get a best of album and put it on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to me, a McCartney mixtape is the pure McCartney album. Yeah, I'd say that. Okay. Yeah. So, mm. yeah, I, I was always, for some reason, to get an album, put it on, listen to that whole album next, rather than go looking for mixtapes, because... As I'm talking now, I'm thinking, I, I don't really think I made all that many, if any, mixtapes that I could think of. They were usually transferring full albums onto cassette to take with me, say, in the car, usually. I, don't, I, didn't, I, I never really did much listening when it came to a Walkman or a Discman or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Or listening now with my phone. Uh, I usually never listen, you know, while I'm on foot. But... Um, yeah, and rarely ever do uh, my homemade playlists did I ever go in that direction. Yeah. It's, you know, it's kind of interesting. The last show that we did on compilations, we had a few people writing back to us. And one person in particular was commenting on what you had said, Darren, about the Hey Jude album. And that the fact that you go from the very beginning to two songs from 1964 and then you jump right to uh, 1968 and you don't even notice the difference. Yeah. You know? it, it wasn't a compilation album to him or to you. It was a Beatles album. And right. it was very easy to accept it that way. And so, likewise, we also had somebody write in to us about the rock and roll albums when they came out in the 70s. And those were albums that, unlike The Red and the Blue, they bounced around chronologically. They weren't all in perfect order by years. And when you hear the music that way and you hear the consistency of it all and how it all works so well together, you don't say to yourself, well, that doesn't fit. You know, you get used to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the same thing with all the American albums growing up on them. They weren't exactly the same as the British ones. They weren't the way the Beatles intended for them to come out. But you get so used to them the way that they are and the, the quality of the music is so strong that it all makes sense. And, um, you know, the sequencing of the songs... You know, in some ways, it doesn't even matter because the songs stand up so much by themselves. And so that's why when it comes to compilations, I've, I've made a lot of tapes through the years, going back to cassettes and then CDs 
and I mix music from the group and the solo together. And I guess in a, in a way, without my realizing it, listening to compilations through the years, although I was never that big on rock and roll music, I used to listen quite a lot to the Red and the Blue uh, rock and roll and love songs. The music bounced around a lot. I guess, you know, that was an influence in the way that, that I might be thinking because I like hearing music shuffled around from different musical periods that way, much like listening to the radio. Right. Man. I remembered that uh, one of my older CD players had one of those uh, uh, magazines that changed discs and it held six CDs. Plus, you could put one in the uh, in the in the individual tray so you could get seven CDs and put it on random. And what I would try to do, I guess this is as close as I would come to a mixtape type of uh, listening, uh, is is try to get seven albums that sort of can be grouped. All right, here's seven McCartney albums. No, nope, just let's keep it to Wings. All right, seven Wings albums in the magazine on Shuffle. Or all of the studio albums by so-and-so from this period on Shuffle. Uh, that, you know, that was, um, that was about as close as I came. And while yeah. you, you were just talking, Ken, I remembered that, uh, one of my CD players, uh, had a magazine that I would use in, in that fashion. But, uh, yeah, I don't know, for whatever reason, I just never, I usually stay. I could totally understand what you're saying and hearing the music jumbled up. It's like a, uh, a, a new listening experience every time, especially if it's maybe, um, not so much a set mixed tape or uh, mixed CD, but if you put a bunch of uh, albums on shuffle, it's a new listening experience every time because you don't know what's coming up next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed that box set that came out of John Lennon's "Give Me Some Truth." Uh, well, it's not really a box set, but what is it? Four CD, right? Compilation, I think of everything. It and, is. It, it's, yeah. it's kind of like thematically driven. Mm -hmm. And yet a lot of times it doesn't, it, I mean, I don't get, I put it on. I'm like, this is like a mixtape. This is all everything of Lennon's hit play. You got however many, four or five hours uh, of everything being kind of mixed together. And it, it's fun to listen to it like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how I like to listen. Most of yeah. all these days, when it comes to the solo music, have your tastes changed as far as, which of the four Beatles you listen to the most these days? Are you consistent through the years? Have you always been the same? Have you always, you know, for example, it's very easy for me, regardless of my musical taste, to say I listen to Paul the most because there's so much more music from Paul. But um, how have your feelings changed at all, if at all, about the solo music? And is there one that you tend to gravitate to the most? Let's start with Darren. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I tend to gravitate to Paul. He was always my favorite Beatle, and I, and I and I, I say this when I when I think about John, I say this and with the utmost respect. Unfortunately, he has the smallest body of work, right? And I think it's easier to have uh, some of that stuff from John, some of it to become a bit played out if you get really intense. I'm one that I can. I'm very capable of getting totally into a particular artist and that's all I listen to for a period of time. And you run thin with John's catalog because there isn't as much there. And with John also, I find, and I guess that's because we, since he passed, we remember him in October. We remember him in December. I tend to listen to a lot of, uh, a lot of Lennon in the fall. I find fall sets in and it's time to, you know, start listening to Walls and Bridges and, and Imagine. And it's just something that's sort of become ingrained in me, uh, in a way. But if, if there was any one, I'd say probably McCartney, of course. And, uh, you know, I've got one, one Wings album that, uh, for some reason, I listen to, you're going to laugh, The Night Before Easter. Uh, <laughs> because it's Wings at the Speed of Sound. Oh, OK. Because it came out in March of 76. I did look up once to see when Easter fell in 1976. And I don't remember if it was in March or April. But something about the album was brand new. Perhaps I just got it. And I listened to it 
maybe even more than once, one Saturday night before Easter when I was 11. Because I was 11 around the time that Wings at the Speed of Sound came out. Mm. And that stuck with me to this day. You know, that vibe that I got that one Saturday night before Easter in 76 stuck with me my whole life. And it's almost like the night before Easter, I've got to listen to Wings at the Speed of Sound. Well, uh, that just goes to show how much of an impact something that happened early in your life can have on you later on. Right. Oh, yeah. And so, with, yeah. with a full sense, of, uh, it's usually more so I'm listening to Lennon. And uh, with Ringo, I find that uh, it's pretty much evenly spread out. George, too, throughout the year. You know, it's just a matter of what era am I, uh, am I in, the, in the mood for. Apple era, Mark Hudson era, Dark Horse era. My favorites, that's pretty much has pretty much stayed the same. And least favorites has stayed the same through the years when it comes to individual albums and, and the four of them. That really hasn't changed much. The way I was thinking in the 80s is very similar, if not exactly the same today. All right, Alan. Uh, apart from the fact that you're working on a McCartney book. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure plays a part right now. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. That is a kind of fluid thing because, um, sort of like what Darren was saying about John stuff. I mean, for a very large part of my life, John stuff was always my favorite stuff. And it was tied into John's political thinking and, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Um, but as Darren says, you know, there's not so much of it. And some of it is Sometime in New York City, which is an album I never really cared that much for. I mean, I can listen to it. it, it it's it's fine. But it to me, it wasn't up to what every everything else he was doing and i understand why he did it and i understand the the point and the journalism idea you know music as journalism just sort of write it quick get it out like troubadours and folk singers of old i get all that it just it it's i remember when it came out being kind of feeling that this was not like what John the, at the level of what John could do. And I was really sort of happy to hear the follow-up albums that he was sort of back to, to what he was doing. But, you know, as Darren says, like there's only so many John Lennon albums. And so, you know, I, I, I spent a lot more time with parts of, of Paul's discography that I haven't spent as much time with before. Although, you know, I really did keep up with it for a lot of the time, you know, uh, you know, getting them when they came out, you know, towards a after the first bunch. Um, I didn't. Um, but by the early 80s, late 70s, I, I was getting them as they came out. And if you look at it now, that's kind of most of the career, right? You know, yep. um, it was only a few years that I didn't. Uh, and I caught up with them pretty well. George, uh, you know, I've always liked George's stuff and, um, you know, maybe there are large periods I haven't listened to it and have gone back, uh, you know, and again, the show is part of it, you know, and e even things like I, I'm pretty sure that when we did Gontrapo a few years ago, that might have been my suggestion because mm. I really liked that album when it came out and I thought it got short shrift and I wanted an, an, a, a, an excuse to sit there with that album again and listen closely to it. But, you know, all of his stuff uh, is, you know, I like. I mean, there are odd tracks that I might not like as much as the others, you know, here and there. But, uh, you know, he did serious work and he didn't feel so compelled to get something out that he, you know, would put out things that weren't up to snuff. And Ringo, you know, Ringo's uh, discography is, you know, it was a little spotty here and there. But, uh, you know, I've I've spent a lot of time with all of it. And, you know, even the stuff that is supposed to be the nadir of his career, you know, uh, Bad Boy and uh, Ringo the Fourth, stuff like that. I mean, there are good tracks on those albums. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, and if we were to decide to do one of them and it meant, you know, listening it, 
to it a couple of times through, you know, for the show, uh, that wouldn't really cause me a great problem. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't really, in a way, have a, a, a favorite among the solo mm. stuff now. I, I think that everything has sort of evened out a little bit, you know, there, there are tracks of all of them that I like and don't like, but, um, I, I think over the years, you know, this is one of the great things about getting old, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you can, you can decide, you know, as a very doctrinaire 20 year old that, you know, yeah, I don't like this at all. You know, I only like this. I don't like that. But, you know, as the years go on and you continue returning to things and you listen with a different perspective and different experience and, you know, it's very possible to come to appreciate things that you used to seriously dislike. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, and for me, that happens in classical music, too. You know, I mean, I, I used to think of, you know, I really was mainly, well, the stuff I liked best was very early music and very modern music. And so the romantic stuff in between, you know, Mahler and Bruckner to me just sounded incredibly self-indulgent. But I love that stuff now, you know, like there's always time to learn something more. And, you know, I think I, I can recommend to people younger than me that this is what you should take that opportunity to do it because there's great music out there and you might not appreciate it when you're 20 or 25, but you might hear what you're not hearing when you listen to it later. That's what I try to say quite often to people about all music mm -hmm. is that you, the impressions that you have early on in your life may not be the same if you listen to it a lot later. Right. You know, I can't tell you how many people I've come across who will say to me, you know, George Harrison's solo music is a lot better than I ever gave it credit for. Yeah. You know, because later on, they understand a lot of what George was saying in his music. It might have been too mature or too deep for them. And then they appreciate it more. Same thing with all the solo music. I always like to say there's never any final word on anything. Yeah. And whenever I hear any anybody really put down the solo music of the Beatles in general, I tell them, you know, well, I say, when's the last time you listened to such and such an album? And if it's been, you know... 20 years <laughs> yeah. or something it's like well give it a listen give it a shot you mm. might have a different impression than what you did back then and um you know taste change and yeah. there's a lot that's why i'm always fascinated by albums in particular that years later are far more respected than when they first came out mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. ram you know which we'll ram. probably do a show on that happens all the time in music nothing is ever the same the, the impressions, the opinions that people have never stay exactly the same forever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I always love to bring up, maybe I bring it up too much, the whole thing about Sgt. Pepper here on this show, that it, it's always been looked upon as being the greatest rock album of all time. And now people in general have a different impression of it, that maybe it hasn't held up. You know, the Where way the, other works of the Beatles have. I'm not saying I agree with that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just saying that over the years, people's impressions change. And now people respect Revolver a lot. Yeah. You know, that's how it is in music. Yeah. I mean, music is a, music and people's tastes are a real interesting thing. You remember Golden Disc down on, I think it was on Bleecker Street, down the village somewhere. And, and there was one time I was in there looking for... Either I guess it wasn't a bootleg. I was actually getting a Beatles compilation, believe it or not. It was one of those Australian ones that had, uh, you know, the the whispering version of I Feel Fine or something. It was just some reason I needed it, you know. Yeah. And I went up to the counter with that and a couple of other things. And I asked for a couple of, uh, you know, singles with picture sleeves that were on the wall that I might have been missing. And the guy behind the counter says, you know why are you getting this Beatles stuff over and over? I mean, why don't you listen to something new, like, you know, or something else, like King Crimson, you know? And, and I was thinking, you don't know anything about me. I have everything that King Crimson did in my record collection. <laughs> and, you know, and in fact, I've probably listened to a wider range of music than that guy would listen to ever in his life. You know, but, you know, people feel really entitled to tell you 
you know, that you're, that you're not listening to the right stuff. And, uh, you know, I mean, and, and I've done it. I mean, hey, as a music critic, it's, it's part of the job in a way. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I've learned a lot on this show. I mean, you know, when I came on here, I was often very dismissive of solo stuff and but listening really yeah <laughs> but but you know listening to it and uh you know dealing with it seriously in real time today has mm-hmm. changed my mind about it a lot of stuff so yeah okay well in, in my particular case um i probably listen to paul the most which like i said is because he's put out the most music. But all four of the Beatles have a special place in my heart, and they all fulfill a need inside of me, musically, where at any given time I can feel like listening to any one of the four of them more than the others. There are times that I'm more in a Ringo mood than the others. So it's just, um, there's just so much now to, to, to appreciate when it comes to all the solo music. And like I said, I never get bored with it because that catalog is so huge. But there's there's so many great attributes you can bring to each of the four Beatles for what they have in their own solo music. And if I'm in a spiritual mood, there's nothing like listening to George Harrison, living in the material world, or some of his other spiritual stuff from All Things Must Pass and other albums. Sometimes I'm more in a light, fun mood, and I want to listen to Ringo. Sometimes I want to hear something really personal and deep, in which case, uh, you know, John fits the bill. And also when it comes to the solo music, and I can also say this, this applies to the Beatles too, because since I spend more time listening to Beatles outtakes from these box sets than just listening to the regular albums, John's catalog, like we said, is, is unfortunately the smallest catalog because of his short life. But I love to spend more time now listening to the John Lennon anthology box set mm-hmm. or stripped down or the imagine box set for that matter because it's a different take on that music different versions of songs different mixes of songs so yeah i mean i'm grateful that we have all that i certainly hope there'll be more of those to come like a mind games box set thank you love to have walls and bridges i'd love to have that plastic on old band but uh yeah that's what i tend to do when it comes to john's catalog all right, a few more things I'd like to ask you guys. How about bootlegs? How big a part has that played in your life when it comes to appreciating the Beatles group solo, their whole catalog? Alan? Oh, I, I never listen to bootlegs. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, actually, you know, bootlegs to me are like the, the, the primo stuff. I mean, there have been periods in my life when I... I barely listen to a commercial Beatles record and just listen to the bootlegs solo and group. That's where you hear the new stuff. I mean, if you've been walking around listening to the regular albums on your Walkman or iPod or whatever, you know, for years, a a bootleg gives you something new. It gives you, you know, something in progress. I mean, to me, that is just the most incredible stuff. And I wish they'd put it all out officially in the best quality. Um, I remember that, you know, there was a a shop in Manhattan called Revolver. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you all know it. And the guy who worked there most of the time that when I was there uh, and and we became friends, it was the late, great Eddie Suarez. Uh, Once I was sort of there flipping through some things and a guy came in and asked for a particular album that had been you know, a bootleg staple and had been released. It wasn't by the Beatles. It it was just another group. And what Eddie said to him is, no, that's, you know, that's just come out officially. And for us, um, it goes out of print when it goes in print for the rest of the world. (laughs) And I kind of like that, you know, it's like, okay, for we only deal with the stuff that is not available commercially you know that's what Mm -hmm. we do um and uh and 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 i was i thought that way for a long time too but uh you know now it's just a big mix of of things um but i think it's a really important part of the of the beatles discography for group and solo if you want to know how they did what they did do you think alan that when you when you say everything should come out it's mainly just because it's the beatles and for historic reasons because 
I doubt there are people who think every single breath they committed to tape is worth listening to. You know, some people think that's really going to the extreme for anybody. Oh, sure. You know, so. Yeah, yeah I, I understand that. And, you know, if you've listened to the entire run of Let It Be sessions, which are available on AB Road, uh, you know exactly why people feel that way, that you don't necessarily want to hear every breath. But if um, it's important to you, to study what the Beatles did and how they did it, which it is to me, it isn't necessarily to everybody. All of the unreleased stuff sort of shows you that, you know, and the bad stuff, the good stuff, the things where they're just learning the song, the things where the song's completely finished and it's a different different tempo or a different meter even, you know. I mean, we, we heard some of that on the anthology, eight, you know, eight sure. days a week and, I think I'll in, be in, back. I'll be back. Right. You know, yeah. so, uh, you know, I mean, to me, that's, it is important historically and it's important, you know, let's say educationally. <laughs> um, but I don't know that necessarily when I say it all should come out, I don't know that I, you know, would think that everybody would buy it. You know, it's, I mm-hmm. would, but, um, you know, but then again, maybe it would lose it. Maybe if it all came out, it would lose some of its allure for me, you know, because part of it has to do with the, um, you know, the aspect of its forbiddenness in a way. It's not really forbidden, yep. but let's say it's illegal, theoretically. Right. <laughs> More than theoretically, uh-huh. I guess. But uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's just that it shows you, you know, how they got from A to B and what A was if B is what came out, you know. That to me is fascinating. Right. Okay. Uh, Darren, how do you feel on this subject? I was never really a big bootleg person when I was younger. I never really particularly liked bootleg vinyl. I had a bad experience at one point, uh, and I don't recall what it was. We're playing, uh, I guess, a bad pressing or bad vinyl. I did some damage, I think, uh, to my to my needle or something like that. So I was never thrilled with bootleg vinyl. I never tended to buy much. I think I've got maybe 10, I'm going to guess, vinyl bootlegs, and they're not all Beatles. But when CDs appeared, uh, then I was much more open to the possibilities of what this underworld of music had to offer. Problem was, it tended to be a little too pricey. You know, so uh, I didn't do all that much buying simply because of the price. Get more bang for your buck if you go with, you know, standard Mm -hmm. releases. Uh, Also, um, there was a store I knew um, in White Plains that used to, New York, Westchester County, that used to... uh, sell bootlegs and when they closed up i really didn't have a a a reputable outlet on how to find things and then you know how to find out about them one and find them um Mm -hmm. there were some publications that would point you in directions but of course always very vague when it came to tracking these things down then of course when everything went digital everything's at all of our fingertips now yeah. Um, so I was always very open to, you know, things coming out on bootleg, but years ago tended not to really, for several reasons, as I pointed out, never really buy them or listen to them. Uh, but today would be very enthused to check out stuff, but it's a blip on, on the radar when it comes to the type of listening I do at home, you know, point. Mm. 99.5. Eight percent of what I listen to is a legal, legitimate r- release. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm probably at ninety nine point seven percent, Darren. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't <laughs> compared. I don't really. I guess I don't. I, I don't really have boatloads of bootlegs, and it you know mainly because whether it was money or inability to find what I was looking for. Or, you know, being burned several times and buying things that were just absolute crappy sounding. I, you know, don't care. I even own this session because it's so unlistenable that, you know, what's the point? Uh, Kind of put what that type outlook would put a damper on bootlegs in general. So I don't have that many. 
I have a handful, good size handful, but you know, they, it's a blip on the radar when it comes to my listening. Yeah. Well, in, in my case, uh, I've done a complete 180 when it comes to my views about bootlegs because when they first came out, my view was how dare anybody put this stuff out that the Beatles are not making a profit off of. That's of lower quality, you know, that, uh, you know, the Beatles catalog was perfect the way it was. Why bother putting out something substandard? You know, and that was that's the way I looked at it for quite a long time. And my views did change because I later learned that there were some things that were unreleased, unreleased songs that I felt were worthy of being released. There's nothing quite like hearing a song that's unreleased, yeah. whether it's group or solo. And you question why? Why on earth wasn't why didn't this come out? You know, the solo careers of the Beatles. Why didn't Water Spout come out from Paul McCartney of all songs? Some people thought it was better than what was on London Town. That kind of thing. In the very beginning, I did buy bootlegs, but you know the sound quality wasn't that great. I would listen to it a little bit, put it away. Uh, but later on, because I certainly... Maybe the Beatles anthology had a lot to do with, with uh, changing the way that I, that I felt about things. But I love hearing, like you said, Alan, the evolution of a song. If songs change from start to finish, if the arrangements of songs, the things that they attempted that didn't work, you know, I find all that stuff really fascinating. Like what was put on the anthology with I'll Be Back. You can tell that it didn't work with a different tempo, that kind of thing. Or even you know mentioning the Beatles anthology again and I love her without those without the the guitar the four note intro that kind of thing you know I find all that more fascinating now than I ever have before and uh, the unfortunate thing with bootlegs for me is that very often I'll buy a bootleg another bootleg will come out that pretty much has the exact same material with a couple of new items and I didn't want to have to spend money just to get the new stuff so I would try and get friends of mine to copy it for me and send it to me. But uh, my interest level is far greater today when it comes to bootleg material. But because of the fact that there's so much stuff that the Beatles put out, group and solo, like I said, over 100 albums, and there's a lot of other music that I like to listen to besides the Beatles, you know, I don't have as much time to delve into the unreleased stuff. But I do find it fascinating when I can. But what I go back to on a regular basis would be something like Hot Hits and Cold Cuts, because when that first came out, those were all songs that hadn't been released before. You know, and that was fascinating. It's like a whole album of material that you never had before. Uh, the Beatles BBC stuff, I treasure a lot because most of them are really good sound quality. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, we did have two collections that came out legitimately. Although I know with you, Alan, you wish the whole thing would come out. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, you know, how many of the bootlegs I go back to on a regular basis when ultra rare tracks came out? That was a very big moment. Yeah, that was. And, 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 and back tracks, which was kind of the same thing. But it was studio quality stuff. Mm -hmm. Different <laughs> takes of every single song from uh, Please Please Me, it started with, and then, you know, later songs. And that was amazing because of the quality of it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you couldn't get much better than that. And sometimes it's funny to hear, you know, an outtake of a song that didn't work and they break down in the middle of it. But that kind of thing, I don't know if I could listen to over and over and over again. As you much as I could, a different take that's very different in its arrangement. You know, um, or had something different than the final, the final release. That stuff I find the most interesting for me and unreleased songs. You mentioned uh, rare track, uh, ultra rare tracks. It was unsurpassed masters. Those series of releases on CD are the ones that really changed my my desire to have bootlegs. You know, like I've said a few times, I was always suspicious of bootleg vinyl. Still am. Uh, but when they when that those series started coming out, I was very enthused. But the problem was there were so many volumes and they were expensive that. Yeah, I'm never going to get all right. CDs if they're thirty, forty dollars a pop. That's what I remember. Right. Mm -hmm. So. But still, uh, every now and then I go back to bootlegs. You know, it's it's uh, not as often as the release versions, but there's nothing quite like hearing something 
that you really find interesting, whether it's an unreleased song or a different take of a song. And um, in some ways, I think the Beatles anthology did a very good job of that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So why don't we move on to our last question, which is, after all these years of loving the Beatles, is your interest level pretty much the same as it always has been in their entire history? Has it waned or has it increased? Just out of curiosity, you know, Alan, start with you. Well, it was always extremely high. So, uh, and, and I can't say it's waned. I, I, I guess it's increased only because, you know, I'm now embracing a lot more of the solo stuff that I hadn't uh, earlier on. So I guess it's always increasing. But, uh, you know, I mean, it, it changes, you know, as you listen to things in different ways and you've, you know, I mean, every, every time you listen to something, I mean, ideally you hear it a little bit differently and, uh, you know, I, I guess it just sort of evolves. I, I wouldn't say that there's any of it that I'm less interested in now than I ever was. There's a lot I'm more interested in now if, you know, if we're talking about the solo stuff, talking about the Beatles as a group, was always, you know, maximally interested, and I can't say that's changed at all. Mm. So it's either the same or more interested. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Darren, you? Pretty much the exact same thing. It's never waned. It's always been uh, very high, if not front and center, number one with a bullet for me. And it's probably intensified with, uh, the year, as the years pass and the release of the anthologies and the BBC volumes and now the super duper box sets and fueling that desire, that hunger to hear it again and again and again. So it, it's nothing else. It stayed the same, but I would say my, my, it, it's intensified. My interest has really never waned. Maybe an individual album that w at once upon a time I thought very highly of. Now I'm like, mm. Press to Play was always a favorite McCartney record of mine, still is, but I really, really was into it when it was new. As years went by, I started realizing that there's some shortcomings here and there that I maybe didn't hear initially, but I still love it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, I still love it. Uh, so the waning may... You know, maybe liking something slightly less, maybe for individual albums that happens. Overall, absolutely not. In fact, it's as strong as ever. Yeah. You know, it's a pretty remarkable thing for all three of us that we all feel exactly the same way. But for me, I think it's a combination of the fact that this catalog is as big as it is. And all these Beatle releases keep coming out. And I do find it fascinating, all the different outtakes that have come out. And uh, even... You know, as we've been mentioning, the BBC stuff, the Beatles anthology, all the subsequent releases before the box sets for Sgt. Pepper, whether it's Let It Be Naked, Love, whatever, that along with the new solo releases and all the books that have come out in recent years. I think we've had a flurry of incredibly great books in which we've learned more about the Beatles than ever before, especially with, you know, the work that Mark Lewison has done in particular. As you learn new things, it becomes even more fascinating, things that you never knew before. So when the history, when you're, when the history becomes more fascinating, if that's even possible, along with the music, it's overpowering in many ways. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my interest level is stronger now in the Beatles, despite the fact that I that I've been on the radio for almost 40 years doing Beatles shows. Some people say to me, aren't you ever tired of it? No, <laughs> for the very reasons that you guys have said and for what I'm saying. So it's it's uh, pretty extraordinary that this whole uh, incredible legacy that we talk about here on this show every time. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Let's wrap things up by giving everybody our contact information, and we'll start with you, Darren. All right. If you want to reach out to me individually, you can send me an email at WFUV. My WFUV email address is DarrenDeVivo at WFUV.org, O-R-G, and the name is D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O. Go to Facebook and uh, look for the page that's called Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio, 
as a post to just my personal page, uh, go to the uh, on WFUV radio page, click like, and we'll be connected then. That way, you can also message me there, of course, on Facebook. And uh, uh, check me out on WFUV. Of course, so uh, many of our listeners are in the New York City metropolitan area. If you're listening elsewhere, you can stream WFUV at WFUV.org or get the WFUV app. Download that and you can listen and hear me. Uh, of course, if you're in the New York City area, 90.7 FM. Uh, we also have an HD2 channel. And you can hear me Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday, Wednesday night, and Thursday night, 10 p.m. till 2 in the morning. And on our weekend uh, HD2 channel from noon on Saturday to midnight Sunday nights. I'm there for the 36-hour stretch on uh, 90.7 FM HD2 only and the streaming. All right. Very good. Alan, how about you? And how about contact information for us? Okay. The easiest way to get me directly is through Facebook. Um, I have two pages, Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. Remixed is more Beatles stuff. Uh, just Alan Cozen is more classical stuff, although sometimes there's Beatles stuff there too. Feel free to message me um, and I'll try to get back to you. Uh, we also have a group email for the show, which is Things We Said Today Radio Show, one word, at gmail.com. And on Twitter, we're at Things We Said Fab. And we have a Facebook page for the show, too, which is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. There's also a Things We Said Today page, which you can you know, leave a message for us or something as well. But, um, you know, I post the shows on things we said today, Beatles radio fans, and we check that one more frequently. So that's the official one. The other one's the bootleg. And, uh, you know, that's that. You might also want to at some point uh, in the near future, if you want, uh, I made a, an appearance recently on the Two Legs podcast, um, which is a video podcast with Tom Hunyadi and... Andy with, Nichols. Right. Tom Hunyadi and Andy Nichols. And uh, we talked about... Uh, they had me on to talk about Paul's classical stuff. Um, I had done Liverpool Oratorio last year. So this time we're talking about Standing Stone and also a bit about the progress of... My book, the one I'm doing with Adrian Sinclair, called McCartney Legacy. And uh, so check that out if you want. And over to you, Ken. Yeah. And like I said earlier, the topic that we are doing right now, that we just finished doing, how we listen to the Beatles, was actually a suggestion from one of our listeners. So you never know. Uh, we could take a suggestion from you. If there's an idea that you have for our show, feel free to write to us. Uh, like we said, um, our email address is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com, or you can contact us through our Facebook pages. And, uh, as for me, my email address is every little thing at att.net. You can check out my website, which is Ken Michaels I do want to mention very quickly that a few days ago I interviewed Kifo Nilsson. Kifo is one of seven children that Harry Nilsson had. He's the second youngest of them. And he appears on the new Harry Nilsson album called Lost and Found, which is made up mainly of the last songs that Harry Nilsson worked on. He also covers Yoko Ono's uh, Listen, the Snow is Falling on there. Hmm. And Kifo, Kifo plays bass on the album. And we talk about the new album. We talk about his life with Dad. Not too many memories he would have because Harry died when Kifa was only eight years old. And um, we talk about the new uh, reissue, the 50th anniversary release on Blu-ray and HD digital of The Point. So if you're a Harry Nilsson fan, check that out. I also did an interview a couple of years ago with Harry's first son, Zach, and they're both right next to each other on my website on interviews page four. If you love Harry Nilsson, you get two Nilsons there. For the price of one, on one page. <laughs> Zach and Kifo Nilsson. Okay, he also talks about his current music activities because he's in a band as well called Brother Sister. If you want to know all about that, that's there on the website. There's always Beatles trivia every single week where you can win one of nine great Beatle prizes like CDs, books, and DVDs. And since I mentioned every little thing, 
I do a live broadcast of that show on WNHU, which is in West Haven, Connecticut. You can listen to that show Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. That's Eastern Time at WNHU.org. And uh, it's only a one-hour show, but it's a mixture of group and solo music, thematic sets, anything Beatle-related, Beatle news, like what you catch in this show. And uh, if you can, please check out that show. And uh, also, I do the other talk show podcast on the Beatles on their solo careers called Talk More Talk with Tom Hunyadi, who you just mentioned. He's in that show, too. Kid O'Toole and Mean Mr. Mayo. That's on every other Monday night as a live broadcast on Facebook at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Go to Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. You can watch the show as it's going out live and make comments. And uh, the show can also be found on YouTube, Podbean, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, everywhere. Some of the same places where you can catch things we said today. All right. This has been a pretty good show and a great idea. So thanks to Albert Rojas for his suggestion. And for Darren DeVivo and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michaels saying thanks so much for tuning in. And we will see you next time. Take care. Take care.